Welcome everybody to the Energy Efficiency Seminar in the town of Somerset. And um, one of the things I'd like to say is that energy efficiency is part of something larger, of course, which is the idea of sustainability. Um, how do we continue to have the world as we have it now um, without depleting its resources, without sending the temperatures up higher than we already have done, um, and what can we do that way? And maybe you turn to the federal government as a solution, or not. The point is that it's been an inconsistent partner for us over time. You've got to look elsewhere. And there are other governments around that are doing things, and one of the governments that are doing things right now is Montgomery Counties is very actively trying to combat climate change in its programs. And Larissa Johnson, our first speaker, um, is the residential energy manager in the Department for Environmental Protection in Montgomery County. And what she's going to do is talk about some of the things that the county is doing to help we, the residents, reduce our energy demands, create more efficiency in our homes, and in that small way, or large way, if it's all of us, do something to sustain the environment. Uh, Ron Kaltenbaugh will be talking next, and Ron is president of the EVA Association of Greater Washington, and he will decode that for you himself. Um, and Ron is going to show another way in which we can actually live efficiently and um, contribute to saving this environment. And Martin Rubenstein is the final speaker, and he is going to talk about the work he's been doing through his sculptures to raise awareness about the environment and about sustainability issues around. So without more ado, to get me off the podium and onto the speakers, I'm going to introduce Larissa Johnson, first of all, of the Department of Environmental Protection in Montgomery County. Good. All right. So my name is Larissa Johnson. I am the Residential Energy Program Manager for the county, for Montgomery County. This is a relatively new position. I've been here for about a year and a half now, and that's when the position was created. My job is to make sure that all residents in Montgomery County have the tools and resources they need, need to help reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the county. I don't know how many of you have heard, but we are the one of the first jurisdictions in the country to have a really lofty goal. And our goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2027 and 100% by 2035. Who has heard this? Raise your hand if you knew this. Three, four, yay, woo -hoo! So four of you have heard this before. It's a very new bill, it just passed in December, so if you haven't heard, that's why. Before then, our goal was a little bit, a little bit smaller, so 20% by um, 2020, or 25% by 2020. So we've increased it, and how do we do that? So my goal, like I said, is to tell residents about energy efficiency measures, energy conservation, renewable energy, and also to inform people of energy assistance programs that exist in the county. What I want to start off with is the fact that actually in the county, we don't have that many programs that are standalone programs. We do have a small tax, um, a tax credit. Has anyone done this for energy efficiency measures? Tax, you have? Okay. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in detail. But if you haven't, we do have a handout here that talks about the four areas that I really focus on here in the county. The first one is energy conservation. I like my presentations to be a little bit more interactive than normal, and I know this is being filmed, but maybe the people who are watching at home also will scream out the answers. Um, but energy conservation, what does it mean to conserve energy? Use less. Use less. Perfect. What is energy efficiency then? Use it better. Yep, so conservation is using less, efficiency is using it better. So for conservation, those are the basic things that you all think of, turning off your lights, right? Don't stand in front of your refrigerator door thinking about what you're gonna have for a snack for 22 minutes. It's not a good idea. Um, you know, all of those things are energy conservation. For energy efficiency, that's the biggest area that we actually have uh, the ability to change or to make a bigger difference. So for energy efficiency, how many of you, raise your hands, have heard of Empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R, Maryland? 
Empower Maryland. Raise your hands. Oh, the same, same people almost. All right. So Empower Maryland has been in existence since 2009. If you read your utility bill, who reads their whole utility bill? All those little surcharges? Same people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's usually what happens. <laughs> yes, and now I'm telling, I'm going to tell you all the little tips and tricks that these other folks know. All right, so Empower Maryland has been in existence since 2009, and when it began, it was a statewide goal to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 15% by 2015. So it's now 2018, so the program is still in existence, and now what they're trying to do is just reduce our, our greenhouse gas emissions 2%, right? every year. So part of that is that the state and all of the utilities have to provide certain programs to you because you have been paying a surcharge since 2009 based on how much electricity you, you use every single month. So it could be a small amount, it could be anywhere from like a dollar to six dollars depending on how much electricity you're using. But that's every month since 2009 you've been paying into this Empower program. And what that means is that you really need to take advantage of these programs that have been created to help you reduce your energy. So the first program is called a quick home energy checkup. Who has had a quick home energy checkup? All right, so a quick home energy checkup, every utility in the state, so here in, in our area, it's gonna be Pepco predominantly. So Pepco, you call them, a contractor comes to your home. They are going to do a walkthrough of your home, check for leaks and things like that. They're also gonna give you up to 12 LED light bulbs just like this one here. They're gonna swap it out for LED light bulbs. They are going to give you high efficiency shower heads. They're gonna switch out your faucet aerators. They're going to give you power strips, advanced power strips, and they're, always, they're also gonna give you a shower starter, which is my favorite thing. And if anyone has this, they'll know what I'm talking about. So there's a little contraption that goes in between your shower head and the actual, the top of your nozzle. And what it does is it lets you let your water heat up so if you live in an older home and you know you have to let your water heat up, this allows it to do that. And then there's a little mechanism that will shut your water off when it gets to that, that temperature so you're not wasting water. So if you're like me and you like to turn on your hot water and then brush your teeth, it will stop running the water so you don't have to, you're not wasting water. Then when you get back into your shower, you just pull this little lever and the water comes on at that temperature. So that usually retails for about $20, $25 if you go to the store, but it's part of this quick home energy checkup, which is no additional cost. Because as I mentioned, you've already paid for it through your surcharge. So if you haven't had a quick home energy checkup, this is the first thing I would tell you to do to increase your efficiency in your home. Call Pepco for quick home energy checkup. The second thing, if you own your home, who here owns their homes? So when you own your home, you can do a more comprehensive checkup or an audit, and that's called a home performance with Energy Star audit. Typically, this lasts, a, it costs about a $400, but because of the Empower program, you're only paying $100 for this. This is gonna be more thorough. They're gonna come in with a door blower, they're gonna do a door blower test, infrared lights, everything like that. Anyone had a home performance audit? Just one, oh wow. Yeah, so this is pretty fancy if you can. They're gonna go into your attic, they're gonna go into your basement, they're gonna check all of your windows, and then they come out with a report that says, here are the things that we suggest you do to make your house more energy efficient. The other bonus of that is that when they give you your report, you're going to find out what rebates exist to help you reduce your utility bill. So there's money there for you to make these upgrades. Yes? If you're gonna get the home performance audit, should you bother with the performance? Good question. So. Typically, they should do all of the measures with the quick home energy checkup when you do the audit. So if you go straight to the audit, you'll still get all the benefits of the quick home energy checkup. So you don't have to do them separately. But you should do both. Well, if you do, if you do the audit, they're going to do all the same things that they do with the quick home energy checkup, but then it's gonna be longer. So quick home energy checkup takes about 45 minutes. The audit takes anywhere from two to three hours. So it's like, it's like step one, step two. Okay, so those are the two big things. The other big thing that's happening in February, if you're looking for a new appliance, part of the Empower program, and just because we live in an awesome state, Maryland, every President's Day, it's Energy Star tax-free uh, appliance weekend. So if you're buying a new refrigerator, new washer, new dryer, if you need a new water heater, that's the time to get it is during President's Day weekend. And that's at any store, no, you won't pay taxes on your Energy Star appliance. 
Also, if you have an old refrigerator, they will take out, your, they will bring you the, your new refrigerator, take your old refrigerator, and they'll recycle it for you, and they'll give you a check for $50. If at that time when you get your refrigerator replaced, you have an old air conditioner sitting somewhere in your home, you can tell them to take that too and they'll give you a check for $25, okay? So there's lots of opportunities for you to become more energy efficient and also make some money. The other programs that exist as part of the Empower Maryland program are the lighting. So who here has uh, LEDs in their home? Yeah, everyone, who has compact fluorescent light bulbs, the curly Q ones? All right, who has incandescence? Oh, look, it's like a smorgasbord of lighting in your homes. Um, yeah, so as we know, incandescence, 90% of the energy goes to heating the light bulb, 10% goes to lighting, so they're not energy efficient at all. CFLs are much more energy efficient than curly Q ones. They do take a little time to warm up. They also contain mercury. So that's the big thing is that the mercury, that you cannot throw them away in the trash or you should not throw them away in the trash and they cannot be recycled normally. So you can't just put them in your recycle bin. CFLs, Curly Q light bulbs, have to be brought back to Lowe's, Home Depot or to the transfer station in, in Montgomery County or Strauss Snyder's, thank you. So a, a hardware store, the bigger hardware stores or, or the transfer station. If they go into your recycling and they crack, which they will because they're made out of glass, you've just contaminated everything in your recycle bin so nothing can be recycled at that point, just to give you an idea. The LEDs though, LEDs that come out, <clears throat> they're gonna, there's gonna be an LED equivalent to everything you can ever think of. In the Empower Maryland program, has made it so all LED light bulbs are actually um, are not as expensive as they are in other states. So if you go into Giant or CVS or any of the stores, you're gonna find that our LEDs are much cheaper than if you went to Virginia or Delaware, and that's because of the Empower program. The other thing is that um, LEDs are made out of plastic, so you can drop them and they'd still, they're still gonna be fine. Yes? Is it the same color as an incandescent bulb? Nice. So color, the other thing, so like I said, LEDs come in any shape or size that you could think of. So you can have them in your recess lighting. You can have an LED globe light bulb for your bathroom vanity. You can have an LED the same size as a candelabra in your chandelier. You can have an LED for your refrigerator. You can have an LED light bulb for your over your stove. The other thing is you can get LEDs in every color in, underneath the sun, sun, pretty much. So when you're looking at your light bulbs now, the big thing to think about is this right here. There's a lighting fax right here. So it's just like nutrition fax. And what this is going to do is it's, one, going to tell you what the equivalent of this light bulb is in old, uh, well, in the terms we used to use wattage. But as LEDs are much more energy efficient, you're not using as many watts. So this is a 60 watt equivalent light bulb, but it's only using nine watts of energy. The big thing here that you want to look at is lumens. Lumens are how bright a light bulb is. This is 800 lumens. The other big thing is the light appearance. So incandescent light bulbs were, were created to emulate what? Incandescent light bulbs? Candles, yeah, candles. So they were created to, yeah, warm light. They were created to emulate a candle. All right, so now this is all up to your personal preference. There, it really has nothing to do with anything else, but warm, which is gonna be incandescent, is gonna be over here, and then cool, which is the daylight, is gonna be over there. And it really is just a little slide that says warm, cool, and then you can even do neutral. Warm is good for your living room, your bedroom. Cool is good for places where you need to see little details. So if you have a sewing room or um, a family room where you're doing puzzles, that's a good place to have the cool light. Yes? Are they dimmable? Yes, so most LEDs are dimmable. This one, in fact, says non-dimmable, but I've dimmed it a bunch of times. <laughs> if I had my light meter, I would show you that it's very dimmable. But what it does is it does a little flicker if it's a non-dimmable LED. So most, most light bulbs will come dimmable now. And they also come three-way light bulbs, every type of light bulb you can think of, but those are the things you want to really consider. So that's your light bulbs. And as part of the Empower program, those are a lot more uh, inexpensive here in Maryland than in other states. So that's part of the program. All right, the other areas that we talk about are um, renewable energy, and I know this is energy efficiency, but just a highlight in Montgomery County is that we do um, Montgomery County solar co-ops. So if you're interested in investing in solar energy, the first thing I will tell you is to make sure you get a home performance energy audit to make sure your home is actually as energy efficient as possible. You don't want to put solar panels on your home and then have all of your air leaking out your windows or out of your attic, even though you have solar panels. 
okay? Um, but in the county, we, we have co county so solar co-ops where you can come together as a group and determine the best opportunities for you. And we have um, information sessions. All of our information you can find on our website, Montgomery County DEP backslash energy. So if you have any questions moving forward, also on this piece of paper here, if you have any, e any questions, you can always email me. <coughs> it's pretty easy. But for the solar part, the other thing about solar is that um, in, in the state, in, in, in the federal government, there are still opportunities to have um, credits back to you. So just something to think about when you're thinking about energy in general. But solar, you know, renewable energy is not the same as energy efficiency, but they do go hand in hand. Just so you know what we're doing at the county. My card is over there if you have any additional questions. My email is on the bottom of this little handout and I will be here for the remainder to answer any questions. So thank you. Let me introduce Ron Kaltenbaugh, who, who is president of the Greater Washington EVA Association and somebody who's very much interested in sustainability issues. Ron. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Ron Kaltenbaugh and I'm gonna talk about a little bit about climate change in general and then some things about some solutions and mostly about electric vehicles. So a few quick uh, bits about my background. I'm actually from Frederick County. I live in Jefferson, Maryland, which is west of Frederick County, about an hour from here, when there's no traffic, uh, up to three hours when there is. Uh, but I used to live in Wheaton, so I, I'm familiar with this area, but it's been a, it's been a while. Um, for my day job, I do uh, IT for a large computer firm. I'm involved in a variety of environmental and uh, sustainability things. What I want to highlight is uh, EVADC, that's the Electric Vehicle Association of Greater Washington, D.C. We always say EVADC after that. Because it's a lot shorter. And I have a handout on electric vehicles, which we, which we talk about during the discussion time period. Um, I just want to highlight, though, that this group meets the third Wednesday of the month, usually at a library around the Beltway. And right now, that library is the Potomac Library. We're there for the next few months. And uh, everyone's welcome. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to have an EV. If you want to just come out and talk to folks and see cars, We'd love to have you out there. I'm also uh, involved with something called the Climate Reality Project. Uh, I went to the Climate Reality Project first uh, last March. This is an Al Gore group that he started after an inconvenient truth to train people to do talks. So not everyone realizes that that movie, An Inconvenient Truth, who's seen An, an Inconvenient Truth? Most of the room. Um, that movie was based on a slideshow that Mr. Gore does. And a friend of a friend came to him and said, hey, we want to do a movie of your slideshow. And Al said, me, slideshow, movie, are you kidding? And initially said no, but they convinced him to do it and, and um, you know, made history. And out of that, um, he, he was already training folks, but he ramped that up, created an organization. When I went in March last year to Denver, there were 900 people being trained. I went back in uh, October to Pittsburgh as a mentor, there were 1,300 being trained. So a lot of people were doing that. And a lot of these slides come from the Climate Rowdy Project. Some are my own, some I found from other, other sources. So uh, a quick tour of, and this could really be a seminar uh, long, a special long seminar course, so, so I'm gonna touch on some really big highlights. So quick uh, conversation about temperature. So one of the things I hear from people, especially if you have uh, you know, the, the uh, stereotypical crazy uncle at Thanksgiving, oh, it's all based on models. Well, I like this next series of slides because this is actual real data from the Northern Hemisphere summertime. And here we see in this 30 year period, this nice bell curve of cooler average and warmer than average temperatures. We jump ahead and now in this 10 year span, we've moved to the warmer side. And in the next 10 year span, we've moved even more to the warmer side. Uh, that average is about the same size, but, it's, but it, uh, the, the warmer has shifted a lot bigger. And then we move over here and we've moved way to the warmer side and we have this actually quite large, it's a little hard to see with the darker color there, extremely hot section. So this is real data, real measurements. This is really happening. This is not you know, models and projections. So I think this is very helpful to, uh, to talk to folks about. A couple quick comments about hurricanes because last year uh, hurricanes were in the news a lot. And this, these numbers are staggering. Um, 33 trillion gallons of water fell in the Houston area during that storm. That's Niagara Falls for 509 days pouring into that, that whole area. Just a massive amount of rain, um, massive amount of water. And so what's going on with all these hurricanes? 
And so there are a number of features here. Um, the science is unsure on whether we'll have more hurricanes or not. That's still up for grabs. They're not sure about it. But the impacts are, re are known and there's no dispute about. So warmer oceans lead to more intense hurricanes because hurricanes get their energy from warm water. They intensify much more rapidly. That was one of the things with the hurricanes last year was they went from one or two category up to four or five, much faster than normal. Warm air holds more moisture. So that's why you get more downpours. This is also why we get big snowstorms when, in the wintertime, when it's, it's, it's more water vapor. And if it's that right temperature, um, we can get more snow sometimes. Storm surge uh, is an issue. Because if the sea level is already higher, your storm surge is going to be greater because you're always starting from a higher spot. And lastly, the jet stream is wavier. Uh, and this is the more of the more newer uh, findings. And that causes some weirdness with storms being able to stay over an area longer. So one of the things with Houston was that rain event just sat there for a long time. So another quick comment I want to make here, and, and when I do a full length presentation, I have more examples of this, but this is a really nice one. Um, we see these cases where we have multiple things compounding each other, creating feedbacks. And this is a good example of this. In Colorado, pine beetles now often reproduce more than once a season. So what happens is we have warmer winters in Colorado, so fewer, fewer, more bugs survive. We have uh, drought, which makes the trees um, less tolerant to conditions. So the pine beetles can kill more trees. And then we have a feedback loop that has these things happening more and more. So these, these things where you have one bad thing and one bad thing making more, you know, more happen and compounding each other are all over, this, all over the planet. And this is just one example. So my uh, last example on, from a climate standpoint is about re uh, national security and refugees. Uh, and in the latter half of the first decade of this century, uh, there was a massive drought in the Sy Syria in that region. This led a million and a half people to move to the already crowded cities. So now you have people that were um, different tribes, different ethnic groups moving to already crowded conditions. 80% um, of the livestock was lost, huge amount of job loss. One of the things that this, um, this leads to is, again, this is not the cause of the Syrian civil war. That's not what I'm saying. But it is something that exacerbates that problem. And the Department of Defense, this is a quote, and I actually went to a uh, town hall that John Delaney held and had an admiral there from the Navy saying this exact same thing. Climate change leads to more bad things like food and water shortages, disease, refugees. In military terms, they call this a threat multiplier when you multiply uh, threats by something else. So let's move off of the, those kind of topics and talk about solutions and get to the EVs. So um, wind energy and solar energy have been growing by leaps and bounds. This chart shows wind energy globally, and you can see that nice curve there. And this is in the United States. Notice the curve isn't the same, though. It's, it's not quite as steep, and there's these little plateaus. Those plateaus where, are where policy changed. Maybe something was delayed. They, they argued over a budget thing. They, uh, there was a lot of incentives and um, subsidies for, for wind that got maybe you know, temporarily put on hold, um, and that affected the markets. Now, it should be noted that the subsidies that have been around for a very long time, for decades, for oil and fossil fuels, they, have, they seem to just keep going on forever, and they're not on hold. Uh, and they are actually larger than subsidies for renewables. So why is this happening? Uh, why are we seeing this massive growth? Because of falling costs. The costs have fallen dramatically. This, this is for onshore wind. Uh, offshore wind is having dr dramatic uh, uh, cost declines as well. I don't, have a, I don't have a chart on that one. Solar, this is the graph for solar. Notice that graph is much steeper. Solar is taking off much faster than wind has. And here's the uh, US graph. Again, leaps and bounds. Uh, and why? Because the costs are coming down. So one of the great things about this story is it used to be you go into a, a town or your, your um, a state offices or wherever and argue for renewables because it was the right thing to do. It, it helped conserve the environment. You talk about all these soft things. Well, now you can go in and argue on, on dollars and cents. It's cheaper. And that's a great, that makes it a great story to tell. And that's why we have cities all over the United States committing to 100% renewable energy. This, this is growing by leaps and bounds. 
Um, the closest one here is actually Columbia, Maryland, and they're already there. Um, and one thing you'll notice about this, this chart is, and this, this map is, these towns and cities are all over the country. They're not on the left coast and the right coast. They're not in the, just the blue areas. They're in red, red states and blue states and purple states. This is not, uh, this should not be a partisan divide. This is saves money. So uh, our first speaker talked about LEDs. Um, and so this is a great uh, segue to that. This shows the cost declines in LEDs on the, in just in their first three years. And then we see the dramatic increases in the market for lighting. And LEDs has gone from 1% of the market in 2010 to projected to be 95% of the market by 2025. And LEDs are so efficient, the savings we measured in power plants we don't need. So this is a really good news story. It's also a good story because what sparked this market was our federal government. This was part of the, uh, there was a, a language and rules in an energy bill in 2007, signed by President uh, George W. Bush, not by Obama, as some people think. And so this is a bipartisan effort to make our lighting more efficient. It's going to pay dividends. So uh, this is all, we're talking about efficiency here. And so this chart is a little hard to, a um, little bit of an eye chart. And if somebody's interested, I can, I can send you a link to it. But this is called a Sankey diagram. And I really want to get over the, the concept is, is more important than the details. On the one side here, we have energy sources. And then we have lines that go to how it gets used, whether for electricity or residential or transportation. And then we have, on the far side there, rejected versus energy services. And as one of our national labs put this together, what this is showing is that light gray is at 59.1. Energy services is at 38.4. So that says that more than half the energy we produce is actually wasted. Now, you're always going to have some waste. You have friction and heat losses, but our efficiency is well below 50% as an economy. So there's tons of room for improvement here. Doesn't get the press that it should. Doesn't 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 get all the headlines. But efficiency is is a gold mine that we haven't uh, even begin to tap. So um, switching to electric vehicles, uh, who in here has driven an electric vehicle? Anybody? A oh, couple. Okay. So a quick comment about what makes an electric vehicle. Um, you heard the term electric vehicle. You also heard the term electrification of transportation. There are three kinds of vehicles that fall into that electrification bucket. Hybrids, like the original Prius. They have an electric motor, which makes the gasoline engine more efficient, and a battery, but they just get energy from harvesting from braking and that kind of stuff. Then you have plug-in hybrids. They have a battery and they have a plug, and you can go some distance, usually between 10 and 50 miles, on electricity alone, like the Vol Chevy Volt is an example of that. And then you have battery, car, battery electric cars, so like the Nissan Leaf or the te Teslas and so forth and so on, and they have no gasoline engine whatsoever, and it's all batteries. It's all electrification, but only those last two are considered EVs. So EVs are great in terms of operating costs, much lower operating costs than, um, than a uh, gasoline car. Quiet, no fumes whatsoever. Uh, instant torque means they're a lot of fun, but they're also safer and it's much more, when I'm in my Nissan Leaf and I'm at the merchant of the beltway, it's so much nicer than our gasoline car because the instant response to the accelerator, I can merge into traffic so much easier. They're much cleaner than, and we've heard it, um, gasoline cars as ice cars, internal combustion engine, that's this, the terminology that those in the EV space use. And they also are using electricity generated in the United States. Only less than 2% of our electricity comes from Canada. Everything else is homegrown, so we're using homegrown energy. So vehicle miles traveled. Um, since the, beginning, since the early 70s, it's been on a steady and rapid climb up. Um, so uh, around, around the year 2000, we started to see a dip in miles traveled, but it's picked back up again. And this is important because transportation is now crossed over to be the largest source of CO2 emissions in our economy. You can see that bottom line there, the light, light uh, green one, that's electricity. It's been pretty flat and trending downward as we do more wind and uh, solar. <clears throat> the top one, industrial stuff. I'm sorry, industrial is the one at the bottom. The top one, uh, electricity, was going up and up and up, but it's gone down a lot. And then the purple one, um, transportation crossed over to that, and it's now the largest source of CO2. So cleaning up our transportation is really a key thing. So this gets to the gentleman's question about um, efficiency and pollution from EVs. 
So one of the arguments we hear a lot is that, well, EVs just move the pollution from the tailpipe to a smokestack. And this map from the Union Concerned Scientist addresses that concern. So what the map shows is, and it's going to be even better because this is from 2014, it shows that if I plug an EV into the grid, what the pollution that occurs from the grid source, how does it compare to a gasoline car? So in California, for example, the, the, um, the, a gasoline car would have to have the equivalent of 95 miles per gallon to be the same pollution as an EV plug from the grid. And most of the country there is in light blue, which means it's above 50 miles per gallon. A lot of it's well, well beyond that. Only in the core of the country there, Colorado and some of the Midwest, is it, below, is, it, is it below that. But even everywhere, even where it's the worst, 38 in Colorado, that's still better than your average new car by a lot, and, and pretty close to a, a fuel-efficient car. We would consider a 30 miles per gallon car pretty efficient for most people. Uh, you have New York up there at 160 because they have a lot of hydro. So the key thing here is the grid gets cleaner year by year. Our gasoline cars get dirtier as we go for more uh, dirtier sources like tar sands, or your car gets older and less efficient. So moving uh, to, to EVs actually is, is cleaner. It doesn't just move the pollution around. Another uh, benefit from EVs is, is uh, fuel cost and the lack of volatility. Notice the pricing here for gasoline uh, versus electricity over time. And electricity there has some, it's a little bit wavy there. It's mostly seasonal changes. And it's going slightly up, but not very much. Whereas gasoline is all over the map. So for, for seniors and retirees, for people on a fixed income, for the economic disadvantage, for businesses that have to plot their, you know, their, their plans and stuff, that uh, volatility in gasoline prices is a real problem. Imagine if you're a company and you put out a bid for doing some work and and then you know, within, uh, you, get, get, you win the bid, but then the price of gasoline spikes up and that's a huge cost, cost of doing business. You have a real problem. So one of the things helping push EVs is California. Uh, California has their, what they call their zero emissions vehicle program. And a lot of states, including Maryland, are part of that. And the key is that these uh, 10 states, counting California, account for 28% of vehicle sales. And so that's a real push, and California's helping to lead the way, despite um, the federal government not doing so so much. Battery costs are falling rapidly. Um, and these numbers, the $100, $109 estimate per, per kilowatt by 2025, I've see, actually seen a lot of people saying that we'll do better than that. And most of the time, these projections on whether it's a drop in solar prices or wind prices or battery prices, they're actually exceeding what the estimates are. Most of the estimates tend to be too conservative. This chart shows growing EV sales worldwide. And the chart ends in 2016. For 2017, it hit 3 million worldwide. Um, the leaders are China. Uh, Norway, per capita, is far and away the leader. And US is in that top three. This chart shows uh, the um, what, reason why EVs cost more today to buy is because the powertrain, mainly the batteries, are, are more expensive. Uh, now, they are, in many cases, they're actually less expensive to operate and life cycle costs are less, but people might make their buying decisions based on purchase cost. And you can see here that around 2023 or so is when people project that the purchase price will be less, let alone the, main, the operating costs. So operating costs can already be less um, but purchase costs will be less in just a few years. And again, this is likely to be even sooner than that. Okay. Um, so, so many countries uh, are moving ahead toward uh, plans to outlaw or phase out fossil fuels. And a quick note on electric buses here. Um, in Shenzhen, China, <clears throat> their fleet of 16,000 buses are now all electric. We only have a few hundred in the entire United States. So we're being left behind in some of these areas. And these, this is a list of countries that are talking about the phase out of fossil fuel vehicles. Basically, um, no more new, new sales. And the list is growing. So some quick final thoughts. Um, one comment I get a lot is the issue of the, of the two degree target. Well, two degrees is a target. It's not pass fail. So actions matter, and whatever we can do um, will help us. And 2.5 isn't great, but it's better than 3. So we need to worry about what we can do. 
And I'll leave you with this final, final uh, cartoon. I came across this, and it really, really says a lot here. So if you have people that want to deny climate, don't want to care about climate, don't talk to them about it. Talk to them about the health benefits, the, the clean air, uh, all those kind of things, saving money, all those things. That's really what we need to focus on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. And uh, our final speaker is going to be Barton Rubenstein, who is a Somerset resident, first of all, uh, but also an internationally known sculptor and who has very much committed himself to um, environmental goals and educating the world in terms of sustainable environments. And uh, he'll tell you a lot more about it than I can. Barton. Hi, everyone. I am one of your neighbors. I'm very proud to be in this neighborhood. We moved into the neighborhood about 16 years ago, and it's been a, an amazing ride together. I'm very proud to be here today to talk about our Mother Earth Project, which was started by our family three years ago, the same year that the climate conference happened um, in Paris, which was monumental. I just want to congratulate uh, Ronald on a phenomenal talk, very informative. We need this type of um, partnership in so many different sectors. Larissa, also, it was really awesome to hear you talk about all the things that are going on in Montgomery County. Um, we need to crowd ourselves with people like these. Um, I don't want to do this project on my own. I look for partners all the time, people like yourselves that are helping me to do this project. I have uh, translators in our neighborhood. I have lawyers doing pro bono work. I have uh, travel agents in different countries that are helping out with this project to raise awareness. Um, I have all sorts of people in communications. I have interns from universities um, and high schools. Um, everyone's doing things pro bono, and, and we're also starting to raise money for this project. So. What I felt from Larissa's uh, comments was that her uphill battle is about awareness, is trying to get everyone aware of all the things that Montgomery County is doing. You're doing it, but it'd be great if people were more aware of it. And how do we raise awareness um, in this world? Um, I think the most powerful event in my life related to awareness was the HIV AIDS quilt exhibition down at the mall, where we all went down there, or maybe you were too young, too young to have been there, but it transformed our awareness about a disease that we would otherwise would have liked to just push under the carpet. Um, and I had the honor of meeting Dr. David Ho, who is a famous um, AIDS scientist, uh, who told me that, that that year was critical in the mid-1990s for um, the Fed and the world's focus on spending money on research. So what we're doing now is starting a new project, which is uh, molded in the same uh, vein as what the AIDS quilt exhibition uh, did in the 1990s. And this is a um, project called Parachutes for the Planet. I'm going to tell you about our project in, in a sort of a haphazard way, so it's not going to be in a chronological way. Um, but this project is we're reaching out to um, people around the world to create Parachutes are 12 foot diameter um, pieces of cloth that are decorated in a way. Here's an example at the bottom. This is a parachute from the climate conference la current, uh, March last year. And this is uh, an example of a parachute with a large image, comments around the edge, and smaller pieces of artwork. Um, each each one of these um, parachutes that are coming from different organizations and schools for this upcoming Earth Day uh, will have an image representing uh, a landmark from their school or their country, um, comments about how they're living sustainably, uh, comments about how their local environment has been impacted by climate change, and a message of hope. So what what this does is many multi-dimensional. One is it engages communities uh, to do something together to bring sustainability to the front of one's mind. 
and then we ask them to display the parachute locally um, to share with their community and then send it to us and we are creating this repository of parachutes which we'll show on Earth Day uh, we're hoping to be at Art Basel in December um, and then for future events. So the AIDS quilt exhibition took about eight years to raise, uh, to gather over 40,000 quilts. Um, so we don't see this, this project has just started and, and our project as uh, citizens of this planet has just started. Um, so that's what we're doing now. And uh, it's been so far very exciting. Um, I don't know whether or not we're going to have 50 parachutes for Earth Day or, or 500 at this point, but there's a lot of people that are uh, excited about it. So now I'm going to start, uh, turn back the clock a little bit and tell you a little bit about who I am and Mother Earth sculpture. Um, so about 10 or about 15 years ago, I actually had the honor of meeting uh, um, Al Gore, and it was a very exciting moment. We had lunch with him with a group of 20 people, and after that lunch, we all jumped up and said, you know, I want to work for you, or I want to do something. Um, but that was sort of the end of that day, and um, it took about 10 or, or so years for uh, myself and our family t to get going on this. Um, and everybody here is getting going on this in their own way. They're trying to change to renewable energy, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, we need to bring it to the front of our minds. Um, so how do we do that? Well, the parachutes is one big project. Um, and in our neighborhood, we started to compost. Uh, the blue buckets was the first big step for our, our neighborhood and for the county. And when we got those big buckets, I remember everyone, uh, myself, saying, well, this is, how are we going to fill this thing up each week? It's so large. I mean, right? Did anyone else have that feeling when you saw that bucket for the first time? But sure enough, within about three um, months, suddenly there was much more going into the blue bucket than our trash bucket. And, you know, I have some sisters in San Francisco, and I uh, call them up and say, you know, we have three bags of trash now, and all recycle. And, and my, uh, my, my kind sister said, well, that's nice. Uh, we put out one shopping bag of trash a week. You know, you know San Francisco is, they're, they're light years ahead. So the thing about this is, is, you know, you can wake up in the morning and feel great about what you're doing. Um, but then you look to the, your sides and you realize, my God, there is so much more to do. Um, and that should not, our hope is that you just understand that this is a journey that we're all taking as, as citizens of the world. Um, so I'm actually a sculptor um, and I, a former scientist. Um, and this is the Mother Earth sculpture, which is cited this one in particular is down in Georgetown uh, along the Potomac River. And it is now the, the symbol of sustainability. Uh, we are now placing this sculpture in different cities around the world. And we're engaging countries. Um, we're trying to bring awareness on different levels. Uh, we talked about the Parachutes Project. Um, and this one is basically engaging countries in a way that makes people feel interconnect, countries to feel interconnected. Um, one of the problems that we've had as uh, being an American is we always feel like we're doing it best. And that's, that's sort of a mentality that we've all grown up with. Um, but as you'll see, and actually Ronald brought it up, is that there's a lot of things going on in, in other countries around the world. And this page is something that we've been very uh, excited about building. And it's basically, it shows um, what each individual country is doing positively to um, be more sustainable. So why is that exciting? Because we want there to be a friendly competition. We want people to wake up and say, hey, they're doing this in Belize, and we're in Cancun, and we should be doing similar things. We want people to be aware of what other people are doing, because there are a lot of positive things. Like the Danes happen to be friends 
with people from the, the Danish embassy and they're like leaders of wind energy. And it's just phenomenal what they're doing. But the, the ambassador told me that, you know, the east coast of the United States has the most premier wind resources that blows away anything off the, the Danish coast. Um, and in fact, I read an article that said that the amount of wind energy that can be harnessed off the coast beyond 20 miles is four times the amount that our country needs as an entirety. Um, there's, it's, it's unbelievable, the amount of energy. Um, so anyway, this is, um, this is a great, uh, and this is updated all the time. We basically are citing uh, articles that are written, that are writing. It's all positive. I mean, there's a lot of negative. What's this called if you want to look it up online? Uh, this is the Mother Earth Project. Mother Earth, okay, thank you. Um, MotherEarthProject.org. And on it, we have the front page, which I just showed you. And the sculptures here, uh, I designed this sculpture. Uh, it's actually the profile of my mother. Um, they're all facing downriver. So if you close your eyes, you can imagine these sculptures around the world all facing downriver towards the collective ocean. Collective oceans, which is, has a powerful, uh, uh, it's a powerful idea. And we've had a lot of positive uh, feedback about that. Um, uh, the history behind the sculpture is more interesting, um, and I thought I'll just share it just briefly. Uh, the sculpture was originally headed to the front of the National Portrait Gallery, and um, at the last second, the director asked to for me to create a smaller scale of this piece, which is now the uh, Portrait of a Nation Prize uh, for the Smithsonian. It's like the Oscar Award given out to great Americans. So. With my relationship with the Smithsonian, they gave me um, the opportunity to take the large sculpture and do what I wanted with it. At the time, we didn't know what that was. Um, and then when I came home to, to share that story with the family, I was half disappointed and half unsure. Um, but my youngest son at the time was 11, said, you know, well, why don't you put the sculpture in the different continents of the world, uh, which was a very large thought, because at the time, most of my commissions, uh, and I've done about 80 of them around the country, uh, only a few abroad, um, seemed like a very large idea. So that's sort of the confluence of that story. Uh, the composting that my wife, who's here in the audience today, Shireen, uh, started with other neighbors. And we decided, well, how can we bring them together? And my son was interested in homelessness, so we, we thought about that. But in the end, we realized sustainability is really the world's topic now. I mean, I don't mean to downgrade any other important issue now in the world, but if we don't have a place to stand and to breathe and to drink, all the other problems of our world are going to um, not be important anymore, unfortunately. Um, so oh, by the way, I would love to field any questions. But what I do want to answer is uh, there was a question about the renewable energy. Um, so one of the, th the projects that we work on and we're continuing to work on, we do a lot of school outreach, but this project is the Renewable Energy Project. Um, one of the problems with renewable energy and PEPCO is that they're re they are required to offer th third party uh, suppliers of power, and there's about 40 on the list, uh, but they aren't required to advertise uh, and encourage or uh, give you it in a, a very systematic way. So we're left to receive this information by phone and by mail, and we're not sure what to do. And I don't want to do it. You don't want to do it either, because you don't know whether you're going to get scammed, and we're all concerned about that. So I decided, well, I will do it only if it's, if it's for a larger cause, to, to help the whole neighborhood do it. So I decided to research all 40 of these companies and find the ones that are renewable. And I found one in particular that's not only renewable, but they provide power that's less expensive than what PEPCO presently charges us. So in the end, it's, it, there's no reason why w one would not sign up. One, you're getting cheaper energy. Uh, two, it's renewable. 
And three, we were giving that, we also give away a, uh, a t-shirt um, from, from our project. Everyone likes a t-shirt. Um, I'm wearing one. Sorry? The company is called Clearview. Um, and not only that, here it is right here. This is the clear view. I'll just, I'll just click the page. So here it is. Um, that's the front page of it. You type in your um, zip code. You choose what to sign up for. This is actually the one, the second one usually one, because this one, they charge a monthly, um, uh, let's see, this one, has, actually, it doesn't. Yeah, it does. It adds $10 a month. So this is the one that we chose is $0.08. Cents and uh, let's see, where is it? This page changes slightly. The prices change slightly. So actually, when we started the program in November, they were offering 7.5. So now it's up to 8.09. So it's a little bit more expensive, but it, it's almost identical or less than what Pepco is offering. You have a question? So the eight point oh nine. What are the others? Well, each one has a different. They add. They give you extra little benefits. Other things like you know, if you have electric car, it'll give you this little extra benefit as far as plugging your car. But basically, um, the page that I showed you originally. It will show you the Q and A is all there. I've done all the Q and A. So here I do. I, I click one of those buttons, and then here you are, right here. Your name, uh, your address. You put your account number right here, which is a long number on the second page uh, on the top of your Pepco bill. Okay, <coughs> and then you basically, if you add my name here as a friend. Um, then we'll send you a uh, select a, uh, is it right here? No, that's not it. How'd you hear about us? Uh, it should say friend somewhere. I can't see it, but. Martin, can I just finish that off? Um, the Maryland Public Service Commission provides the complete list of all companies that are supplying energy at the moment to Maryland. It shows the, how they get their energy so you can identify the ones that are 100% renewable there. It shows the current costs per kilowatt off the energy, so you can price compare on that site. And it has a link to the different companies, so you can get from the Berlin Public Service Commission site to the company site. I will say, as Barton is discovering, that the prices that they charge are not constant, that they do vary. And so when you see the price there, um, it may well be the price that you pay this year, but it will change next year, and it will change relative to the PEPCO price next year. So to be most aggressive, you, what you should really be doing is changing your companies regularly, always looking for the most efficient one. Mm -hmm. This is a 12-month contract. So you, you lock your, your prices in. Now, of course, it could, there could be some fluctuations, but Typically, the price of energy is not changing that fast. So it's plus or minus the same. Right now, the people, we had about 60 people that have signed up, and their prices are like 4% less than what Pepco is charging now. You know, whether that's the same in 12 months' time, even if it's 4% more, the average will be, the sum total will be a zero sum total, but you still will have renewable energy when you turn on your lights you'll have renewable energy coming into your house. So um, in, even if you're paying 5% more, you're still going to be pay, having renewable energy. And we need to, um, we need to do that as a, as a town and hopefully as a county. It would be great to get everyone on board with something like this. Well, the same That's a great question. And it's a complicated question. Um, I will answer as much as I can. But what Pepco is a provider of energy. It distributes energy. It doesn't create energy. So right now, I think, I believe that 12% of Pepco is renewable energy. Um, that's what they're required to do. I know that 
so they need to make they need to make sure that they provide 12% of their energy to to you at the very minimal as renewable energy but you can you can elect to choose a third party that is of other types um, so when you choose clearview and change to it you'll get your pepco bill and at the bottom it will say your energy is provided by clearview and clearview provides wind, electric, and hydro energy to the grid. Did I answer your question? Well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean that literally um, you're getting only renewable energy and the person next door is getting only fossil fuels, but you're basically adding to the system. You're, you're, you're putting pressure on PEPCO to, uh, if we do this collectively, to, to bring more and more renewable energy onto the grid. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that you know right now um, our plans for the uh, the Mother Earth sculpture have we've already placed the sculpture in China, um, in Jerusalem, Israel, and Cameroon, and obviously in Washington D.C. And now we're uh, negotiating with uh, Chile and Argentina for Buenos Aires and Santiago. Um, and it's just, you know, then we'll have all the continents. And actually, Italy is also another one uh, on our list that is happening this year. Um, so it's very exciting to, to have Mother Earth in different continents. And it's also, um, I'm friends with uh, Glenn Prickett, who's of the Nature Conservancy. And he basically asked me whether we consider putting the sculptures in this country because there's so much work that needs to be done as far as awareness here. Um, and I actually was just on the phone with uh, the mayor's office in Miami, and we're going to start to do that now. Because obviously, as everyone knows, um, the mayor sent a delegation uh, of, of, uh, from the U.S. Conference of Mayors to COP23 in, in Bonn, Germany, last November to represent our country, to show the rest of the world that uh, we are committed as a country to uh, honoring the Paris Agreement with or without the federal government. And I think that's a very important and powerful uh, message to the world because we need to stay connected to them. And, 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 and it's been interesting with this project because we've been interacting with different governments around the world um, and getting their reaction. But I think that uh, my feeling personally is that the resolve is, is stronger now. The, world, the world's resolve to solve this problem is stronger. Um, and I think this present administration has not uh, weakened that resolve. It's actually probably strengthened it. Um, listen, to, we were meeting with the Minister of Environment in Chile. Um, that's, that was sort of a quote from him. Um, so I'm, I feel very upbeat about this. Uh, I, try to, I try to focus on the positive things that's going on and you know, hearing from Ronald and Larissa, that's, I, you know, that, that's a pick me up. And I feel like you know, we just need to stay focused on what we need to do and, uh, and spread the word, basically. Thanks a lot. Sweetheart, think about your future. Jeff over there did, and just look at him. He saved up, bought a house, he's got a beautiful wife, they even had a fancy pants destination wedding, and oh, oh, they had a baby! Ah! Smart and handsome, ooh, la la. Ah. Now, I've been saving these frames for pictures of my future grandbabies for years, and the shopping sprees on organic clothing and eye telephone cases is not helping you save for a family. Oh, gracious! Look at that! He's a model! <gasps> I bet you he's putting all that money right into a 401k or his baby's college fund. And his teeth are so straight. See how good saving can look at feedthepig.org. Feed the pig. I understand. I know it's not your typical resume. Okay, well. But
candidate. But I've been working double shifts just to pay for books. I've been raising my two little brothers. I'm determined, driven, motivated. Isn't that what you're looking for? Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org.